This is the FMN Prize for Innovation. What we do is growing of our plants without the use of soil. Aquaponics is highly scalable. We convert cassava wastewater into electricity. Wow, this is something really exciting. What's the end product? This is what FMN needs to make their feed. You were able to show us very big, bold ideas. But can you take those ideas to the next level? Unfortunately, you will not be going into the next round. Jukes, congratulations. Being winners of this competition, we've received immense support from FMN. And we sincerely, sincerely do appreciate that. FMN is committed to feeding the nation every day. And we are committed to also discovering and nurturing talents. Come in, pitch your ideas, and we're there to support you. That was last season. Right here, right now, we're doing it again. The term sustainability has been given various meanings and interpretations over the years. But the crux of each definition or narrative is to build an ecosystem that does not compromise the standard of living for people today or in the future. A paramount requirement to human and environmental longevity. To achieve this, there is an urgent need to develop local content across the country. And Floor Mules of Nigeria PLC, FMN, has taken deliberate measures to enshrine local content utilization and development through various initiatives like the FMN Prize for Innovation, PFI. The theme of the PFI 2.0 is innovative techniques for local content development in the food and agro-allied sector. The bold and intriguing question before us all today is, amongst these six top contestants, can we find the top three inventions that address the theme of this year's PFI? To find out, you need to stay tuned to this broadcast. I'm Ayo Myra Essay. Welcome to the live broadcast of the FMN Prize for Innovation Pitch Event. In my house, we may look alike, but we are very different individuals. Everybody believes their way is best. That's why Golden Penny Pasta is our favorite meal. Golden Penny Pasta, made with durum wheat, is tasty. A sauce of protein and fiber, and non-sticky. So you can cook, serve, and eat your pasta just the way you like it. With Golden Penny Pasta, your way is best. This year, we had over 400 fantastic applications come through. So you can imagine how much work went into selecting the top six finalists. They're here for a chance to win 10 million Naira in cash prizes to grow their businesses. Well, the judges are ready and the stage is set. Let's meet our judges. had over 400 applicants. What are you looking out for? I didn't think I'll start with you. What are you looking out for in their pitch today? The next big idea in addressing food security issues in Nigeria. Excellent. Thank you. Meso, about you. What are you, what's going to make you see someone and think, yeah, this is definitely a winner? Confidence that can actually build and scale the idea that they have. All right. Excellent. Mira, What's your take on the style of presentation? What's the, that winning thing that you're looking out for in a finalist today? For me, 
a lot of it is about the passion. How passionate are you about what you're doing? And are you really ready to do this full time? And are you already doing it full time? Tell me what you're doing. For the farmers of Nigeria PLC, this is season two of the PFI. What is it, what's in it for you? Why is it important to hold such a pitch event? Well, I, if you reflect on what's happened globally and also locally in the last one year from when we had the last PFI, I think it gives pure justification for why we need to do this. I think food security and food sovereignty are the top of everyone's agenda now. So it's very important to innovate and find very creative ways to increase our food output and reduce our food wastage. As you can tell, our judges are certainly ready. Friendly, but definitely looking out for that X factor as to who's going to pitch to win either 5 million Naira grand prize, second prize of 3 million Naira, or third prize of 2 million Naira. This is FMN Prize for Innovation Season 2. My name is Eunice Adewale, co-founder at Smokeless Briquettes Energy Solutions. I'm looking forward to actually winning this because it's going to be a long way to actually bring to pass my hopes and expectations for my company. Hello everyone, my name is Eunice Adewale and here with me is Kenneth Uche. We're the, founder, we're the founders of Smokeless Bricks Energy Solutions. According to the National Bureau of Statistics, more than 80% of households in rural Nigeria uses firewood for, for cooking. What this means is that a very high demand has been placed on our forest reserve, which is fast disappearing and is now way below the 10% recommended global levels. On the other hand, statistics from the World Organization has also revealed that more than 98,000 women die annually due to smokes inhaled while cooking with this firewood. Now, my question is, must our mothers continue to sacrifice their lives in order to cook the food we eat? No way you agree with me. This is why we have founded Smokeless Briquettes Energy Solutions, an eco-inclusive social project born out of a desire to save our mothers from respiratory health challenges and save the environment from climate change by providing environmentally friendly and affordable clean energy solutions through recycling of agricultural waste into sustainable, eco-friendly biomass briquettes. As smokeless bricks, we produce eco-friendly smokeless briquettes, which are smokeless, odorless, cheaper, and burns longer than ordinary charcoal. It doesn't spark or emit carbon and helps to conserve the environment. We are also working on producing our smokeless stove which will contain a stainless steel burn chamber that reaches up to 500 degrees in less than 10 minutes and enable five times faster cooking than any traditional stove. The heat from the stove is going to be stored in a lithium-ion battery equipped with the stove so that users can charge their devices such as their mobile phones, rechargeable lamps and so on in real time whenever they need it, even when the fire is off. Our middle target customers are low-income households and rural community dwellers in Nigeria who currently still use this firewood and fossil fuel for cooking. And we hope to target the 67 million low-income households in Nigeria who currently use this firewood and other fossil fuels for cooking. This innovative energy project provides easy access to sustainable and affordable clean and climate smart solutions for the rural poor across Africa. These projects will go a long way to reduce carbon emissions, minimize deforestation, and enhance sanitation through integrated waste management. It will also improve livelihood by providing green jobs for women and youths in Nigeria and across Africa. So far, basically, our, our revenue model is basically production and sale of these biomass briquettes. But we are also working on quantifying and monetizing the carbon offset generated by our, by our projects. So far, we've had about 43,000 users cut across five southwestern states in Nigeria, and we hope to double this figure by the end of 2023. In two years' time, we hope to increase our reach to 60 states in Nigeria with a projected 100,000 users and a projected monthly revenue of, of $50,000 monthly projected re revenue. 
Also, in the next five years, we hope to increase our reach to the West African market because the cooking energy crisis is not just a Nigerian problem. It's a general African problem. So we hope to increase our reach to other West African states, countries, with a projected 1 million monthly users and a projected $300,000 projected revenue. We have a compact team with verified skill sets and a cumulative of 25 years experience with a very rich advisory board. At Smokeless Bricks Energy Solutions, we strongly believe that mothers do not have to sacrifice their lives in order to cook the food we are going to eat. Thank you very much. My question is, um, can you walk us through the production process for your um, smokeless uh, brisket, particularly the stove, and also share with us what the price point is in comparison with other clean cooking sto uh, uh, stove solutions? We're located in Ondo State, Akure. And then what Ondo State is known for really is, uh, first of all, Palm, can, um, palm oil, uh, Ondo State is the second largest producer of palm oil in Nigeria, and the, also the second producer of bitumen in all of West Africa. So what we use for the production of our briquettes is the palm kernel front. So the farmers in these areas, when they, um, they use the pulp itself for the oil, they use the nuts for granite oil, but then the shell itself, it's nothing to really do with it as far as they are concerned. So it's always littered around the places. So this is what we use. And then for our smokeless stoves, uh, we are currently working on a, a smokeless stove. Um, what we are trying to achieve is that we want to make sure that women don't need to, I mean, I mean currently Nigeria is facing the problem of, uh, uh, what's it, um, uh, I mean, the cooking energy solution in the rural community is getting worse because first of all, cooking gas and the kerosene is becoming very, very costly. Now, there's an even women are afraid of going to the forest to pick food for cooking because of the current um, uh, security challenges. So the normal price for a kilo of charcoal is 500 naira, but we sell ours for 300, uh, 350 naira. And then the reason why it is cheaper than the ordinary charcoal is because the raw materials are free of charge. So we don't pay for that cost. This is a waste for the farmers. And then this is what we use for us. That's the way we've been able to break that cost of production. My name is Eugene Oshomoigbe, and I'm the founder of Oshomoigbe Global Ventures Limited. Being a young man that grew up in northern Nigeria, I mean, there's lots of sunshine over there, and I thought to myself, how can I convert this into something good? Beyond just making money, how can I use that to be, should I say, a blessing to my community and to the people around me? I'm here to see and to learn, to glean from the knowledge of people who have gone ahead, who have passed this stage before. Hello everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Distinguished judges, my name is Eugene Oshomoegbe and I'm the founder of Oshomoegbe Global Ventures Limited, OGV. Have you ever wondered when it comes to food wastage, especially in Nigeria, it's amazing that over each Nigerian um, accrues a waste of 189 kilograms of food, and that accrues to 37.9 million tons of food wasted every year. And this is according to FAO. Now, at OGV, part of what we are trying to do is to solve this problem that is bedeviling not just Nigeria, but Africa at large. According to FAO also, do you know that smallholder farmers, and as well as the agricultural sector in Nigeria, loses over $9 billion worth of revenue annually? And this is as a result of post-harvest losses that is experienced by both the smallholder farmers and as well as the agro-processing sectors in Nigeria. Now at OGV, to deal with this problem, what we've done is we've been able to set up a solar drying facility where smallholder farmers and agro-processing businesses and individuals can bring their products and have it processed for them at an affordable fee. And beyond that, we took it a step further by designing our own locally fabricated but highly efficient solar dryers. Now, these are business model and these are some of the pictures of the dryers that we have. So basically, we have two models in which we make money as a business. First, we have a solar drying center where we have our dryers located and we put it in the heart of the communities where these farming um, processes take place. So these farmers can bring their products to us and we dry it for them at an affordable fee. Or we have the alternative of also linking them to the market 
that's doing value addition to their product. Secondly, we target agro-processing companies as well as households. And what we do is we build these dryers and we sell it to them at an affordable fee, saving them the stress of trying to import these um, machines, which will cost them lots of money and at the same time take quite a long time before they are able to get it into the country. Now for the UN SDG goals, our business falls under the no poverty SDG one as we are creating jobs for women and youths. And for the SDG two also, we are tackling the problem of hunger, ensuring that there's food available for all. SDG three, uh, we look at good health and well-being, ensuring that the products that we process are done in a very nutritious manner. And we have SDG 7, 8, and 13. For the 13, climate action, that's why we are using clean energy to reduce the amount of carbon emission in the atmosphere. Because most of these foods, when they go to waste, they release high amount of carbon monoxide, which is harmful to the environment. For our market size, there are over 38 million smallholder farmers in Nigeria, according to the FAO. What we're looking at now is to see how we can service 200,000 smallholder farmers over the next five years, as well as targeting 200 agro-processing companies as well. And for our reach currently, we are able, able to serve 100 smallholder farmers monthly and three agro-processing companies. We've been able to reach out to 3,500 smallholder farmers since inception, as well as to 10 agro-processing companies. Also, I would like to add here that we've been able to reach out to 500 women through trainings in our processes. So why not join us today to see how we can curb the issue of post-harvest losses and also ensure food security, not just for our nation, but for Africa at large. Thank you. Thank you, Eugene, uh, for the presentation. Um, interesting concept. Um, just like to drill down a little bit about uh, the technology and understand uh, also the market. So you're involved in drying of vegetables, primarily? Um, no. OK. Primarily, I'm involved in manufacturing the solar dryers. So solar dryers. But yes. your, your target market is for vegetable farmers? Yes. OK. What types of vegetables? OK, vegetables like tomatoes. So if I'm going general, I'm going to streamline them to say, for perishable vegetables like tomatoes, onions, and pepper. We also dry fruits like banana, orange, and pineapples as well. Then we also dry grains. We also dry fish as well. And we also use cabinet dryers for the drying of fish. And it's purely um, from solar? Um, yes. And some of the, I'll quickly add here also that we designed it in such a way that it's hybrid. So much so that you can power it using solar and you can also power it using electricity. I just want to understand a little bit about your charging structure uh, to the farmers. Mm -hmm. So when you offer these services to the farmers, how does it work? Okay. So what we did was initially, we wanted to charge them at 50 Naira per kg. But we realized that that was kind of like a little bit complex for them to understand. So you bring in five baskets, we weigh the first one, and it's giving us 50 kg. We weigh the second one, and we're getting 70.5. So the farmer just feels, so we now said, okay, let's get a benchmark price. So what we do currently now is we charge them at 1,500 for each basket that they bring in to dry. 1,500, irrespective of the quantity? Um, irrespective of the quantity, yes. But when it comes to, you know, the baskets of the tomato come in various sizes. There's a big and there's a medium. So for the biggest size, 1,500. For the medium size, we give them at 700. Then for the smallest, we give them for 200 naira. Tomatoes are my game as well. Um, and I would imagine that this is very relevant for the tomato farmers. A lot of the times when farmers get to the point that they're drying their tomatoes, it's because they're already selling at a loss. So I'm curious about how not only your economics, but the economics of your customers. Do you know how drying is impacting their ability to make profit? Part of what we did to our model was to look for off-takers already. So we ensured that before getting these products from the farmers. Actually, the farmers don't just come and dry to take back. There's always the option of, if you want to dry and you want to take it back, not a problem, you can pay us the money. But if you want us to connect you to an off-taker who will buy those products from you, it's still not a problem, we can do that. As a matter of fact, that's the model we work with currently. So we have lots of off-takers on ground, then we go to the farmers to off-take the products, dry, then we sell it across. 
Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Ade Tola Okonawa, and I'm the co-founder for Big Farm Foods Limited. When we started, we couldn't see further than where we, you know, had currently got into. Um, but eventually, because we also have background in business, and we've had, we've been in this area of production for a long time, in different areas or different verticals, um, it was quite easy for us to get our footing. So I want to walk away with the grand prize, uh, which is uh, the five million, right? Um, which for us will be a capex, you know, for the business. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yes, hi. My name is Ade Tola Okonawa, and I'm here to present our product uh, from Big Crown Foods. Um, we will be narrowing down our discussion to one particular product, which is the tiger nut milk, which is what, what, how we were able to get here in the first place. Um, okay, so pretty much about uh, the company itself. It's an agro-processing company, and uh, we are committed to processing and uh, packaging high-quality products um, in the grain industry um, to provide to our basic customers. And uh, what we also did, um, or what we've done, or what we achieved so far, uh, we have looked at the fact that uh, NAPC, uh, we are certified by NPC now. Um, we also had a license by um, NAFDAC also. So our products are actually um, ready in different stores. Uh, we were, top of the, were part of the top 20 that uh, Nigerian Exports uh, Promotion Council has chosen um, to help facilitate our FDA license and also the HAPCP um, license. And this even happened just yesterday. Um, so today, uh, our mission, to be honest, will be basically to meet our customer needs um, for ready-to-eat meals um, on the go so that it's easier for um, people to prepare healthy foods without going through the rigor of uh, the kitchen. Right? And right here with me is actually my wife, and uh, she will be helping us to prepare the sample uh, for you to have a taste. We have trained women uh, in rural areas, basically on production. Uh, most of our, our workforce are on contract because of uh, the cost of having uh, overheads. Um, and uh, we also have a factory in Abelkota. So it's easier um, to transfer this knowledge uh, because at the end of the day, as we expand, they will be the people we will be recruiting um, to our production line. For the product itself, we have uh, our target audience, which is between the ages of 18 um, to 60, basically because of the health factor. Um, where so this is a plant-based uh, product. So it's actually good for lactose intolerance people uh, pregnant women, older people, uh, for digestion, to make uh, digestion easier and to be able to also assimilate uh, nutrients within um, in the body. Uh, we also target medium high income earners and uh, corporate institutes, uh, hotels, restaurants, schools, NGOs, retail sources, um, chefs and other caterers. Um, we do a lot of direct sales, business to business, uh, online sales, stock listings, um, stalls and uh, we just recently started exporting because we are looking for other partners or distribution channels um, that can take off our products in whole and then have them disseminate to other areas because that is where um, they, their domicile. Food hygiene is quite important to us. And we found out from World, World Health Organization that only in 2021, over 200 people died from foodborne poisoning. And so we don't want to be <laughs> listed as part of the companies that cost such a thing. And so we're putting um, the right processes and the right checks in place in our production. So what I'd really like to do is for you to have a taste, since we're narrowing it down to the, uh, or oh, I can also bring, should I bring them to you? Do you have you water? Yes. Okay. Um, this is flour. I'll change this flour. Uh, we're doing both actually. And which one is the stronger revenue stream for you? Well, for now, it's Nigeria. Um, it's closer to home, SOR, you know, so uh, we're able to establish a certain relationship with the chain stores. Um, that's why we're still going after the bigger ones, the, spas, shop right, and the rest of them. Um, so that at the end of the day, the production will be met according to our, to our projections. Very excited to see your products and brands. Thank you. And as context in my, my day job, um, an investor looking to back companies in the sector right. to scale. Right. And so it's always interesting for me to see entrepreneurs bringing new brands and products through the pipeline. Yeah. We don't engage early, but we like to see who is coming through. So when they've gotten some scale, then we can then engage more, more actively. All right. And um, now, a couple questions for me, just to understand 
your company a little bit better. Can you give context on why you started, uh, what led you this direction? Okay. And then if you can give a, some indication um, of scale, uh, uh, and some numbers would be confidential, but volumes, factory footprint, just to give capacity, how many retail outlets you're in, and just to give an idea of okay. your, your footprint and what you've been able to achieve. Okay, so uh, first of all, it started in 2019. Um, and in 2019, we had, uh, well, we had a mutual friend, my part, my co uh, the founder and I, uh, Judith. Um, there she is. And uh, it was, it's the, the, a friend had a bit of health issues, high blood pressure and all of this. And she was also lactose intolerant um, and she had, in, 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 uh, should I say, immunal imbalance. And um, we did a bit of research since she's, she's an analyst, so she, and she really likes the health industry and she did a bit of research and she's also lactose intolerant. Um, so we did a bit of research and say, look, what, what is it that we can do um, to provide certain solutions in the health space um, for people? And that's how we came out with the whole Tiger Nut series or the different products that, or the different product lines that come out of, of Tiger Nut and the health benefits. Like I said, it was good for people who are pregnant, uh, people, old, older age people, um, and even malnourished kids. So that was the drive behind the creation of this brand. I'm by name Musa Ali Pashi, CEO and founder of Palmax Syndicate. I read a report um, in 2014 where I saw how the amount of it has been wasted. That gave me the motivation to start processing this fresh tomato into powder. Palmax Syndicate is all about adding value to agricultural produce. Right now, what we do currently, we process fresh tomato into powder. Um, we have our trademark as Palmac, and then the slogan, we exist to make life better. Palmac Syndicate, as I said earlier, is, all about, is, is, is aimed at adding value to agricultural produce. What we do currently, we process fresh tomato into powder. Looking at the tomato value chain in Nigeria, Nigeria is the 14th largest producer of tomato, and second, in Africa after Egypt. But out of what we produce yearly, we produce 1.9 metri million metric tons of tomato and only 1.3 make it to the marketplace. We lose 600, mil uh, 600 metric tons of, of tomato yearly. And as of this year, we are, we are, we are, we are looking at the, the, there will be more lost because of the cashless policy in play. Because these farmers doesn't have, don't, don't even have bank accounts. So they can't sell their fresh to, uh, produces. So this is our solution to the problem of wastage in the tomato because uh, our demand, the demand for uh, tomato in Nigeria sta still stands at 2.5 million metric tons yearly, which what we produce is too little to meet up to, 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 to the demand. So what we do in Palmac is we situate dryers in the communities that produce these uh, tomatoes in large quantity. Um, we've in uh, business with OGV. These dryers, they situate it to a, those communities that has a lot of uh, tomato they produce. They, what they do in, with those dryers is they wash their tomato. After washing their tomato, they slice it and then do the drying. We also have our own farm. So, but because we cannot, what we produce, we cannot, be able, cannot serve our market. So we engage those farmers. We engage them in two ways. We give them um, extension services. The second thing um, we do with them is we're in business with them. Once they dry this flex, we collect it and then we process it into powder and retail it to consumers out there.
In conclusion, the idea of situating those dryers to their locations because of the, the first uh, reason is the wastage they encounter during transportation. The bulk of these tomatoes are wasted because of transportation. Bad road. So for them now to take this tomato from their locations to go and find who will buy it, it gets wasted and on the way. And then the second thing is reducing the uh, waiting period for the uptaker. They have to go out to meet the uptaker to buy their pro, uh, tomato to process it. So we giving them these dryers, what they do is they decide when to sell their, pro, uh, their, their tomatoes. Because once it's dried and in, into flex, they, it can stay for a very long period of time without being, because this tomato, it, when it's fresh, it just takes seven days. After seven days, it becomes a waste. And with this innovative um, idea, we can be able to export to other African countries. Already, uh, Niger have tested our tomato, um, Cameroon have tested our tomato, and they are already demanding for more. And we are solving the problem of uh, zero hunger under the SDG, SDG 2. Thank you for listening. Great. Musa, thank you so much. I have to jump in because, you know, tomato, <laughs> I'm very into tomato. Yeah, tomato, tomato. So, um, where are you based? I'm based in Bayou. Okay. Uh, close to Dadinkua. Okay, Dadinkua. Okay. Beach. And um, who buys your tomato powder right now? Do you sell it to individuals? Do you sell it to distributors? Do you sell it to companies? Like, tell us about the market for the product. Okay, our, our product, uh, we sell it to the general public first. We also sell it, our, our, our major uh, consumers are the student in campuses. We locate campuses because how it's easy to use. So how do people use it? You just get a sachet. If, if you can. If you, you can, can bring, bring us. It. Yeah, let's, let's. Thank you. We would love closer. to see the sachets. Yes. Thank you. Are you Thank you so much. Oh. Yeah, you can answer while you're, while okay. you're giving it to us. I'll take one of those. So this is, this is what? A powdered tomato. And this is what? Same thing. Yes. Okay. Okay. Just different sizes. Yes. Different sizes. Do, uh, this are you is, sure? This is this is. Uh, I shouldn't be asking if you are sure. <laughs> <laughs> this is what we started using, uh, but we it's been this one has been uh, for a very long period of time. We uh, did this okay. since during our sampling. We, when I was called for the competition, we actually rebranding our oh, packaging. Oh, in the process of changing. Oh, yes. Yeah, okay. So but I couldn't get. The new one. Tomato naturally loses color over time. Okay. That's, yes. That's a. Okay. So, okay. This, so what this we do? Is what it so looks your like. students take this thing, they buy it. The, yes. And the then best. what do they mix it into? They, they can they mix it into paste. They can do soups with it. Okay. Mostly they do stew with it because once you get this one, you get a bowl. Um, put it in a bowl. Add water, hot. You can use hot or cold water, and it swells up. It's very cheap because like this, we sell it at eighty naira. Mm. And, and how does that compare with, uh, with the sachet tomato? With the sachet tomato. Once you add water to this, it swells up. It can give you two of sachet of tomato. Sachet. So it's the cheaper. Sachet is cheaper. It's cheaper for them. And, and if this is, is 80 naira, I'm not in the tomato space. So if this, how much is, this is 80 naira. Yes, we give Then normal naira. sachet tomato liquid is, or paste, naira. is 100 naira. Yes. Okay. And you believe this can give you twice yeah. the output of. Uh, it can give you even more. More. Yes, because it swells up. It's already dried. Okay. Yes. And uh, our uh, other markets, um, we sell it to, we even, the, the, we give it to stores. Though the shop owners, the shop owners uh, in the market, they're the reason why we are rebranding. Mm -hmm. um, they don't like it in single like this. Okay. They want it in, um, in rolls. rolls. Yeah. So uh, we... So you we have to get a different... Packaging yeah. for that. Yes. Yeah. So we were able to get uh, the packaging machine and then we decided to rebrand, change the whole packaging so that um, it will be feasible, like what is inside. It can be seen. It can be seen. Musa, thank you so much. Thank you very much. My name is Osato Ela Serenge and I am the founder at El Gazal Foods. I'm so thrilled and happy to have been selected as a finalist. Being here today, I'm looking forward to milking all the value I can get from them, you know, learning from the mentors and also telling them about our innovative idea in the Kirishi industry.
My name is Osatoe Oseringe, and I am the founder at El Gazelle Foods. Our innovation is a climate adaptation innovation in Nigeria. We are increasing the protein intake of Africans by reducing post-harvest loss. Now, in 2019, I started this journey because I almost lost an aunt or a family friend, so to say, after she had complications from consuming contaminated roadside kinishi. During my research, I discovered several problems. Now, usually in Nigeria, an average Nigerian doesn't take the required amount of protein intake, which is 0.8 grams of your total body weight. And this has, however, caused malnutrition in so many. Globally, 1.3 billion tons of food is wasted. Nigeria accounting for 15% of that, according to FAO. And you know that when there is no food, there can never be life. Lastly, Nigeria has a high rate of deforestation, according to Conver Con Conservation International. About 413 trillion tons of land is being burnt every year, hectares of land. And now, this doesn't only affect you and I, it also affects our climate. And this is where El Gazelle comes into the picture. We are positioning ourselves at the forefront of innovation by making protein more available to Africans in form of snacks like kilishi, chicken kilishi, goat meat kilishi, pork kilishi, turkey kilishi, just name it. Now, with just a pack of kilishi, you are rest assured of your daily protein intake. Secondly, through our One Woman, One Goat program, we are empowering women in our community and making sure that goat meat is available all through the year for our farming. Now, we are also reducing post-harvest loss by partnering with 11 farmer associations to get our garlic, ginger, pepper, granite all through the year. We are also preserving our climate with the machineries we use in our production to reduce climate change deforestation. I beg your pardon. Now, from the farm down to your table, our process starts from our quality control analysts checking sure that these animals and the crop, they meet standard. Our meat is taken into the factory. It is being sliced and put into the dehydrator to dry from 75% moisture content to 45%. Then our ingredients in their grinded state, a little water is being added. Then it is being massaged on the meat to dry from 45% moisture content to 10% moisture content. Then we batch code and package for distribution. Now, our impact on farmers. We are empowering Level Farmers Association. That's about 1,000 farmers cumulatively, where we've been able to increase their standard of living from less than a dollar to two dollars per day for most of them. We are also teaching them on food safety practices. Our impact on the environment, we are reducing post harvest loss and reducing the high rate of deforestation that is affecting the climate change. Our impact on the economy, we are reducing unemployment in our little way with our staff strength of seven. We are also increasing the G Nigeria's GDP and putting the kilishi industry on the global map through our export program to other countries. We are also selling, selling to over 70 supermarkets in Nigeria, like the likes of Just Right. We are selling to clubs. We are selling to universities. We are selling to NYSE camps also. And in turn, they can also empower their staffs. Now, to you and I, with just a pack of this, your daily protein intake in a day is short. We, our business is not just scalable because of the fact that we are NAVDAC or SON approved, but because we are bringing a new variety of protein snack into the market. Chicken kilishi, pork kilishi, and different varieties of kilishi. Now, the more supermarkets and all those people patronize us, the more we are able to empower farmers, increase their means of livelihood, support them, and reduce the effects of deforestation on our climate. We have the market because from 40 packs in 2019, we've been able to sell 7,000 packs every month currently. From one farmer in 2019, we, sell, we partner with 11 farmers 
I beg your pardon, my mouth is dry. 11 farmers association right now. So there is potential for enormous growth. And that's why we are pitching to Flower Mills Nigeria so that they can be a part of our success story. The grants that we get will be used in getting a fairly used delivery bus because we have our factory in Ocean State. And sometimes it's so hard to send our products from Ocean State to Lagos because most of our customers are in Lagos here. 20% will, will, will be invested in our one woman, one goat program so that we have goat meat available all through the year. 10% on our granite farm and 10% on getting machinery worth 950,000 and the rest will be used to get raw materials for our production. The farmers are depending on us and we do not want to fail them. Thank you. Do you slaughter the meat or you buy live cows and... Uh... Or you buy the actual meat, sorry. So, yeah. so it, it's a two-way street. Sometimes we buy life. Sometimes we buy, we, we go there physically when they are slaughtering it and they weigh it and sell it to us. Because everything still depends on, you know, the, the capacity we have financially to purchase at that point in time. And that's why we've started this one woman, one goat program so that we ourselves can boast of having like uh, a, a goat farm where we have goat meat available all through the year. Currently, we have about two goats, two female goats now. Let me ask you maybe a fairly direct question. What is unique about your product? Because uh, Kilishi has existed for a long time. Uh, hygienically packed Kilishi has also existed uh, for a while. Uh, even abroad, they call it by a different name. They, they spice it, one can argue a bit differently. So what is innovative about your product? Okay, thank you for that question, sir. So first, I'll start with um, number one to be the empowerment we are giving local and small scale farmers. And not just that, I mean, the machinery we used in production, because I can remember when I wanted to learn this, I had to travel to about five Northern states to see how they make it. And I see that they just light firewood and spread it on a, on a gauze for it to dry. And that was, that is however not hygienic because I mean, the world has gone health crazy and health conscious right now. So we use a dehydrator to dry it. It's a machine and you know, it just fans it till it completely dries. And another thing that I would say is um, quite innovative is the fact that I don't think you will go to any store in Nigeria today and see chicken kilishi. It's, it's just beef. And our best seller is the goat meat kilishi. So people are, people want, um, I mean, different varieties, different spices. They want, to, they change taste. I mean, the taste, taste bowl of consumer is changing from time to time. So from beef, we just say, okay, since people like chicken, let's try it with chicken. Then we plan to also add additional spices and so additional spices, yeah, later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It, does, it does taste very nice. Thank you, so thank you, ma'am. Thank you. All the best. Mm -hmm. Thank you, ma'am. I am Dan Larry Ogundipe, the CEO and founder of uh, Indigo Farms and Bio Resources. We are into the conversion of uh, cassava, peas, and uh, pork to animal feeds. Hello, everyone. Hello, Hello. good afternoon. Hello. I am Dan Larry Ogundipe, the CEO of Indigo Farms and Bio Resources. At Indigo Farms, we produce two products, cassava siftings and uh, cassava pellets, residue pellets. It is not a new invention, to be honest. There is nothing innovative so much about it because our grandmothers in the villages have been feeding goats with uh, cassava peas from time immemorial. But the innovation we brought to the table this time is the consistency in the product quality and quantity. Over time, we have been able to achieve consistency in volume of production and quality of production. And this quality has given us the market to enter Europe and the Middle East, Saudi Arabia to be precise. The concept is that we take the waste, aggregate it from the Gari clusters in the villages, rural farmers that want extra money to get from the products like cassava tubers when they sell. We take the pills, these are the pills, something like this. 
we dry it, clean, then we hammer mill it. That will form the cassava siftings. Then for the second one, which is the pellet, we collaborate with uh, starch factories. The Nigerian uh, agri uh, industry for cassava, we are the largest producer of cassava in the world, but we are not the largest exporter of cassava products. And this is also one of the, uh, the things that we lack in Nigeria because when we don't earn from foreign uh, exchange, we have the economy as it is now. So we try to get some partners from abroad to give us the idea of a partnership in terms of producing quality pellets that can be acceptable anywhere in the world. So we were able to establish a partner that is working and that we are selling to at a consistent basis. Then for the peas, the cassava siftings, we are able to we are able to combine our efforts with uh, other big uh, feed industries in Nigeria, the Eastern Flour Mills in Calabar, selling to them too. So to be honest, that is just it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Quite a succinct uh, presentation. Yes. So maybe you want to talk a little bit more about, uh, I know you've touched on the product and I'm sure we'll come and see a little bit more of it, but just the, what you're currently doing, what's your capacity um, of production? Is it just the pellets that you're producing? Um, what's the capacity of that, where you're located? Uh, you mentioned uh, the kind of people that you're selling to, um, I think, one sadly piques my interest as one of our group companies, Eastern Premier Feed. Uh, so maybe let's start with that. Thank you, sir. Um, the first uh, question is about where we are selling to. No, what's your... What, 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 where we are producing from. So what are you producing today? You're producing pellets. pellets. And uh, siftings. Pellets and siftings. And siftings yes. What is your capacity to produce? We have seven tons per day now while the other smaller companies, the artisanal ones, are having like one ton per day capacity. And then they are not going international. They don't sell B2B. We, we are selling business to business, bulk trailer load, like 30 tons per consignment. So besides money, what is the most important thing that you think you need that you don't have that will get you to that one container every day getting exported? It's the energy you talked about, the energy. dryer. I cannot sleep in the night. If the weather does like this, I check my Google map. Google <laughs> weather, what is happening? Is rain going to fall? My workers will say, huh, if there is rain, no work today. And it gives me on yeah, uncontrollable. Yeah. So if I can solve the energy problem, power will be done, uh, cost of production will be done, the volume. The workers too can also focus on the core aspect of the business because we need quality control. What options are you looking for, energy? Energy, in terms of generator, then mm. in terms of the dryer that will dry it. Thank you, all the best, thank you. In my house, we may look alike, but we are very different individuals. Everybody believes their way is best. That's why Golden Penny Pasta is our favorite meal. Golden Penny Pasta, made with durum wheat, is tasty, a source of protein and fiber, and non-sticky. So you can cook, serve, and eat your pasta just the way you like it. With Golden Penny Pasta, your way is best. It's still pitch day for FMN Prize for Innovation Season 2. And I'm back in the judges' room. And you'd agree with me that they've had a grueling time. Actually, who was grilled? The contestants, the pitchers, or the judges? Because they had quite an engaging conversation and was so good to see. Well, they have another task ahead of them to deliberate and find out who will emerge as top winner for today's competition. But let me ask the judges first of all, Adenike, Mezwo, Mira, and Sadiq, how has it been for, for you? Let me start with Mira. First of all, as a tomato lady, I'm so excited to have seen two tomato businesses 
uh, presented today. But beyond the tomato piece of it, I thought that the quality of all the contestants was really high. Everybody had great business models and uh, was really passionate about what they were doing. I didn't think we could top season one, but this is really on another level again, was to see a few of them come with their co-founders. So it was nice to see not just one person, but two, two persons in some cases who are playing different uh, strategic roles um, in growing their, uh, their businesses. So that was great to see. I'll come to you, Mezo, next. So what, in one word, how would you describe the quality of the finalists for season two of FMN PFI? I was very impressed. And I was making mental notes because there are a few of them I want to follow up with after the show on real life use cases. When I found out that they've already started making connections with one another, there may be some possible business deals that are coming from this. I was also personally excited where at least one of the uh, finalists is also dealing with one of our group companies. Whilst we leave the judges to go away to deliberate, I'll put it to you, our ladies, gentlemen, boys, girls watching out there. In the comment section, let us know who you think should emerge as season two's winner of the FMN Prize for Innovation. We'll be right back after this break. The judges are back. This means that we are inching closer to unveiling the winner of the FMN Prize for Innovation Season 2. And so I'll hand over to the judges at this point. And in a moment, the six finalists will file in for the verdict. Stay tuned. Hi, candidates. First of all, I want to congratulate you on getting this far. Um, you have done an amazing job. You prepared a lot. You worked so hard. And I wanted to give you a little bit of insight into what we as the judges were really thinking about as we made our decision. So first of all, we did have a clear winner emerge, um, but there was a very tight competition among the rest of the pack. And in order to differentiate you, we had to go back to the meaning of this competition, FMN Prize for Innovation. So we were really trying to look at who had the big idea, who had a clear innovation process. If the criteria had been different, I think we would have picked different companies. So you guys are all on track. What we wanna do right now is give each one of you a little bit of feedback about your presentation and about your business before we let you know who is moving forward and who will not. So first, we'll go in the order of presentation. Um, Eunice, you are the driver of the company. And when you presented, that passion came through, although I think you were a little nervous. But in the Q&A, you stayed really silent and you just let sort of Kenneth do all the talking. I would say step in, lean into your role as the leader. You have a lot to say, you know about your business, flex that muscle. So thank you very much. Eugene, yes. in terms of opportunities for development, I thought initially uh, your business model wasn't fully clear. It wasn't stated very clearly that it was both, you know, in the equipment and also in the drying that didn't come out clearly, but I think it subsequently came out. But in line with that, your strength uh, is manufacturing. And particularly in this environment where there are not many people that are making equipment uh, such as yours or uh, labor saving devices, it's important that you put forward your strength. Uh, particularly when you're presenting or speaking to people, your manufacturing bias and your strength in manufacturing, you shouldn't be uh, proud not to put that in front. So just remember that, okay? Well done. I think the next person that presented was Tola, yes. Big Farms. And you came across very confident, very personable. And uh, for me, that's important, especially if you're selling a branded package product. You have to be able to be able to sell that product to potential consumers that, that are out there. And one feedback for your partners and yourself is to really think through when is the right time to transition, to be fully on board, to give the business the focus it needs to properly scale. So the next person was Musa of Palmer. It was really great listening to you. Your passion was very evident. 
you are street smart, you understand your space, you understood the issues around tomato processing and you understood the issues around the opportunities. It was also great to hear you that you're already even exploring the market, um, even beyond Nigeria, and you're taking that advantage um, as, as far and as wide as you can. Um, so please continue on that. In terms of areas for development, um, you had some more time to pitch. You were very short, you used the time slightly less. Um, you could have also spoken a bit initially on the financials before we eventually um, prodded more for it. So just always remember that the numbers also are very important, even without being prodded for it in the initial part. But well done. Mm -hmm. uh, the next person was Osato from El Gazelle. Uh, I told Ayo at the beginning of this mm. process that I was looking for passion. Mm. You had so much passion right off the bat. I loved it. I loved your energy. I loved how much you love this product. It's very clear that you're focused on it, that you really want to make it successful. I also thought the product was delicious. I don't know if you noticed, but I sort of stopped asking questions halfway through because I was busy eating. <laughs> yes. um, it was really, I live in Kaduna. I eat a lot of kilishi. It was very tasty. Mm -hmm. So you have great recipes. I want to see what's coming next. I think, you know, that part was awesome. In terms of, you know, one important piece of feedback, you stressed quality so much, but you didn't tell us if the product is halal or not. And, you know, if you're making something that has pork is a, you know, can be polarizing in this country. And mm -hmm. so making sure that it's very clear that if you are making pork products, they're in a different building or that you're using different equipment. I think it's important to make sure that that comes out. I think the other piece of it that's important, we didn't ask you about this, but understanding what your unit economics are. So on every pack, you said you were selling 7,000 packs per month. What is the revenue from that? What are your operating costs from that? So that we can understand how much do you need to scale to become truly profitable. But great job. Yeah. And last, but definitely not the least, is Damilari of Indigo. Um, I think that when we heard you, it was clear that you're an ex experienced entrepreneur probably even more than most of, most of the other um, contestants in, in today's session. Um, you've done a lot of work, you've put in a lot of energy. Um, your product, cassava, your processing cassava, which is you know, a wild, widely used product um, within the country, uh, but you're exploring how it can be used to continue to add value and innovation along the process. And we really, really commend that. Um, I, an area to watch is, please listen, um, so that you understand the question. You did answer the questions eventually, but just also make sure that, you know, I think in your excitement to respond to us, um, we, we felt that you needed to just listen to the questions a bit. Um, I think it was also good to see that you had sought investment. Um, and I think that that's something that a number of other entrepreneurs would wish that they're done. Um, however, we think that um, it's also clear that you, needed, you need to build on your um, financial literacy skills to the knowledge of understanding how that can then apply um, for business growth and also making those decisions um, in the way that they should and that would also help you and the business to grow. So thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. So we've now come to the point where um, we have to narrow down to the top three. And so I'm going to ask three of you to please come right up. So just take a step forward. Um, first is Eunice of Smokeless, Adetola of Big Farm, and Osato of El Gazelle. Thank you to the three of you for presenting and for sharing your innovations. Um, I'm sorry to inform you that you will not be making it to the second round. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Great. So we have three finalists. Um, I would like to ask Eugene of OGV to step forward and Musa of Palmark to step forward. Congratulations, both of you are proceeding to the final round. Thank you very much, Dami Larry. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you so much, judges. That was fantastic. Thank you for the feedback to each of the contestants. As we've said a number of times that from over 400 fantastic applications down to six finalists, each person who presented or pitched before you today is clearly and certainly a winner. And we don't know how you were able to find out who to emerge as our ultimate winner for this edition of PFI. The moment we've been waiting for, the moment of truth. Again, I'll say over 400 applicants, six finalists, a time of deliberations and pitching their best ideas to ensure that they emerge as this year's winner. We'll announce now who will be going away with our five million Naira grand prize. Ladies and gentlemen, for those who are watching us right now, you can type in the comments and let us know who you think is walking away with the grand prize today. I'll give you like 10 seconds so we can see if you're right or wrong. Gentlemen, are you ready? Yes. Are you sure? Okay. All right. Let's go. I'll approach the bench <laughs> of judges to pick up who the winner is and then I'll share as to who the winner is. The verdict is in. I have the results in my hand. Ladies and gentlemen, the winner of FMN Prize for Innovation Season 2 is... We'll take a break when we come back. <laughs> <laughs> In my house, we may look alike, but we are very different individuals. Everybody believes their way is best. That's why Golden Penny Pasta is our favorite meal. Golden Penny Pasta, made with durum wheat, is tasty, a source of protein and fiber, and non-sticky. So you can cook, serve, and eat your pasta just the way you like it. With Golden Penny Pasta, your way is best. Welcome back. It's the FMN Prize for Innovation Season 2 pitch event. And just before the break, I was about to announce who the winner for Season 2 is. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I have the result in my hands. And we have our finalists, the final two out of over 400 applicants for this season's competition. The winner of the FMN Prize for Innovation 2.0 is Eugene of OGV! Congratulations, Eugene. How are you feeling? Um, you know, initially I told you <laughs> I was composed, but now <laughs> I really can't say I'm just really overwhelmed. Winning this fund, one of the things it's doing for my business, beyond helping us to get more machines for our operations to scale, is going to help us further brand out more and to be able to put this brand before the faces of a whole lot of people.